All righty. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, we have Paul Rosen here with us um, from the ESAR mission, which is a new uh, mission through NASA in, I believe, India. But uh, he's going to be telling us more, more about, the, about the mission today. Um, so this webinar is part of the Year of Climate and Carbon. So I'm very, very grateful to have Paul and a representative from the NISAR team over at JPL in uh, California, United States, uh, joining us today to tell us more about the mission. Um, so if you have any questions at all during the presentation today, please add them to the chat. We do ask that you keep, you keep muted, um, but I think we will have time for question and answer at the end. Um, so over to you, Paul. All right, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, talking about my favorite subject, which is the NISAR mission. Some people say NISAR, some people say NISAR, some people say NISAR. So it's your choice how you want to pronounce it. It stands for the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar Mission. ISRO is the Indian Space Research Organization. I think most people know what NASA is. So this talk uh, I gave, uh, it, it was last Monday, a, a week ago Monday in India. I apologize for not tailoring another talk uh, specifically for this audience, but it's been a bit of a whirlwind for the last three weeks. Uh, uh, when you're in India and you have meetings still in the United States, basically you're on 24 seven. So I do apologize, but I think the, the content here actually is the right content for this audience. This was given to a group of uh, students and faculty in India, um, in the state of Kerala at Trivandrum, uh, as part of a global science festival. So I tried to tailor it to a broader audience, and I hope it uh, resonates with you as well. Uh, so this, uh, the title is International Radar System of Systems for Groundbreaking Earth Science. So uh, the outline of the talk is, as you see here, uh, just giving a mission overview, talking about the measurements and instrument characteristics, science plan, and how we're interacting with the science community. Um, and I'm going to motivate it with a number of videos up front. So many of you are probably familiar with NASA's Earth System Science Program. They've divided uh, the world into a number of different focus areas that you can see listed on the bottom left there, uh, atmospheric composition, carbon cycle, and so forth. Uh, and by virtue of the constellation of satellites that NASA uh, maintains, develops, and launches, uh, they create global products such as what you can see uh, uh, in the animation in all of these different discipline areas. The NISAR mission contributes to quite a few of these, in fact, the carbon cycle and ecosystems, climate variability, earth surface interior are the three main focus areas that NISAR is, is focusing on, but also contributes to water and energy cycle, uh, as well as to some degree atmosphere. So this just shows you NASA's fleet of instruments. And if you look carefully, you can see NISAR is down here. So a very large program for Earth System Science, and we believe that NISAR will be a major contributor in this area. So first, um, just giving you a little bit of a background on what NISAR is and where it came from. The idea here is to use synthetic aperture radar, which I'll say more about in a minute, to capture dynamic changes on the Earth in a way that is really unique to the way synthetic aperture radar works. This came from the decadal survey of 2007, believe it or not, uh, almost two decades ago, where the community recommended observations suitable for synthetic aperture radar that could capture the dynamics of ice, the dynamics of forest and other woody biomass changes, and the dynamics of our solid earth in order to address important uh, questions, many of which are related to climate, and carbon, and uh, which is good for the theme that uh, the GLOBE program has, as well as uh, as well as natural hazards, hazard response, and you know how we can mitigate risks for large populations that often seem to congregate around areas of uh, of great hazards, such as earthquake fault zones or uh, cities near volcanoes and such. 
So the products you see on the left, uh, very colorful. I'll describe these in more detail as we go along. Through, um, through happenstance to get the mission going, we partnered with India. Uh, and that was very fortuitous because they were really quite interested in uh, all of these science disciplines on a global scale. But also they have a very well-developed remote sensing program for applications. And one of the additional areas of interest to ISRO, uh, in addition to these, was, uh, was coastal processes in India, uh, offshore, ocean winds, bathymetry, as well as just how the coastline's changing. So as we developed the mission concept over the last 10 years or so, uh, we took all of these major science disciplines into account, trying to understand dynamic changes of Earth. So with that, I wanted to show you, just first introduce you to what the mission looks like. This is a major uh, satellite. It's a very large satellite. That big reflector that you see there, whoops, Sorry, that was not what I wanted to do. The major uh, reflector that you see here, uh, hopefully you can see my pointer, that's a 12 meter diameter, 36 feet diameter reflector, nine meter boom, and like a five meter bus structure with electronics, uh, stuffed with electronics for two major radar systems. It's, uh, it's, as I said in the title, a system of systems and I'll go more into what that means in a later slide. It's kind of a, a beautiful animation we see here. I actually saw the system in person two weeks ago, and it looks just like that in, in real life. So now I'm going to show you a video showing the launch sequence. This is a launch vehicle that's provided by the Indian Space Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. I always uh, enjoy that myself, and I've seen it probably a hundred times. Okay, so that shows you the launch sequence and the deploy sequence, a very complicated system of systems again in order to make this observatory work. Once it goes into orbit um, in that configuration, then it starts taking data using synthetic aperture radar techniques. For those of you who are not so familiar with that, this animation sort of illustrates conceptually what's going on. So the radar is flying along in orbit, 
and it's sending pulses out many times per second, over a thousand times a second. Each of those pulses illuminates a very large area of the ground because of the long wavelength and, and relatively small antenna compared to an optical system. And so that gives you very low resolution imagery. But because we're pulsing so fast, any given point on the ground is seen thousands of times as the spacecraft is flying along. And we can take that uh, and take uh, many of these observations and synthetically create a, a uh, radar antenna or aperture, which is thousands of meters long or kilometers long. And by doing that, again, with the wavelength that we have, we can take all of those and synthesize a high resolution image. And that's what you see happening in the top right corner of this. It goes from a low resolution image from a single pulse. And as you accumulate more and more pulses, by virtue of creating this very long synthetic aperture in space, you can make a very fine resolution image. So that's the synthetic aperture radar in a nutshell. We fly this system in a way that it's going to uh, repeat its orbit exactly every 12 days. And by virtue of that, we can make an image and then another image 12 days later, another image 12 days after that, and create a time series of these images. Because they're radar images, they're actually uh, coherent, meaning that we can actually measure the wavelength uh, phase, the phase of the wave that is being transmitted, kind of like a water wave you can measure from crest to crest easily. Uh, we can measure from crest to crest the, uh, the radar wavelength. And we can use that then as a meter stick for change in the position of the ground relative to the satellite as time progresses. So over a year period or two year period, we can measure the motion of the ground down to centimeter or millimeter kind of precision. And that's what this is illustrating here. This is the Central Valley of California, which is being used um, for agricultural purposes. Below the surface of the ground is uh, a water table, an aquifer, and water is pumped from the aquifer and used to irrigate the fields. And you can see the consequence of that is subsidence of the surface. And that's what you're seeing in the colorized three-dimensional view here subsidence of the surface over a period of time, which is on the order of about a meter in this particular rendition. So quite uh, substantial, and this can be seen all over the world using this technique. You'll note not all the places are colorized here. That's because of limitations of the existing data. NISAR will fill in all of these missing areas very effectively. Here's another example of that kind of surface deformation. This is in California, in uh, Los Angeles. This is the Los Angeles area. And what you're seeing here, uh, notice all of these earthquake faults that are colorized in red. What you're seeing here is the slow motion on a yearly cycle of the surface of Los Angeles going up and down by about one inch or, or two or three centimeters, peak to peak. So every house, every car, every person and tree is going up and down. Uh, on a very small roller coaster every year as water is pumped out from below the surface and then re-injected. One of the most interesting things about this map is how the earthquake fault system seems to be controlling the flow of water below the surface and therefore the, the expression of surface deformation. So this is very interesting scientifically. It's very interesting from an infrastructure management point of view looking at roads uh, cracking and uh, pipes bursting and things like that. And just uh, geophysically very interesting to understand the aquifer below the surface. Here's another application. This is um, taken from other data, again, from another satellite, a map of biomass from the radar reflectivity that is created uh, using uh, the ALO sensor. So the, the green colors are uh, high biomass, so dense forest. The red colors are lower biomass. And as you go down towards the blue, the blue is uh, water in this case. We're flying along the Amazon in South America. And you can see very clearly, there's a lot of dense vegetation. As you get closer to the river, there's inundation. Some of the color is due to that. Um, and if you look carefully as you're flying along here, you'll see some very regular patterns. Uh, that are clearly not natural. These are due to the, uh, the uh, logging patterns associated with uh, 
extraction of logs as well as uh, you know conversion of forest into field. So there you can see those sort of wish, uh, fishbone patterns of uh, deforestation. So by making this kind of map, we can look at changes in biomass over the life of the mission. A map like this that you're seeing in this animation took well over a year to produce because of the way the data takes are usually made. Uh, NYSAR will be making a map like this every week or so, and that will really allow us to track the changes. So another di science discipline is understanding the cryosphere. So here's a, an example made from airborne data, similar to what would uh, NYSAR would be taking of the velocity field of an ice cap in Iceland. So you can see the white streamlines here are the direction of flow and the length of the vectors tends to be related to how fast it's flowing. The color shows also how fast the ice is flowing in this particular case. So by measuring, um, by measuring the change in the position of the ground relative to the satellite using this uh, interferometric technique that I'll talk about in a minute, we can measure these kinds of flow fields uh, precisely over all the ice sheets and mountain glaciers as well to give us a feeling for not just what the velocity is, but what the changes in the velocity might be over time uh, that are being influenced by uh, seasonal as well as climatic variations over the life of the mission. So those give you uh, sort of a window into the main science disciplines, understanding global biomass dynamics, understanding global ice dynamics, and understanding global hazards, as well as applications such as aquifer health and studying agriculture. Uh, NISAR can do a lot for many, many different disciplines, uh, science disciplines, as well as applications. By virtue of the fact that it is a um, global systematic measurement that the radar with its very long wavelength, centimeter scale wavelength can see through clouds to give persistent measurements, uh, both day and night and in, in, somewhat independent of weather, we can create these reliable time series measurements of surface deformation and change. So getting a little bit more technical now, for those of you who are interested, um, these describe the, uh, this, this slide describes the science observation summary, uh, the, the kinds of characteristics of this system. We are operating using two radars. One is built by NASA, the other built by uh, in ISRO, and uh, they operate at two different wavelengths. The different wavelengths give you different sensitivities to the stuff that's on the ground. So things that are larger in scale uh, are, are, um, are more sensitive to the L-band signal, and things that are smaller in scale are more sensitive to the S-band signal. So for example, in a forest canopy, you will see more backscatter from the smaller leaves in the canopy at S-band than you will at L-band. L-band tends to penetrate through and scatter off of larger things such as branches and trunks. So this gives you a nice scaling of the dynamic range of the signal you see. You can see smaller things and larger things, uh, more sensitive to a wider range of biomass variability, as well as to sensitivity and deformation. Uh, we use a, a new fancy technique called SweepSAR that I'll say a few words about later to get a very wide swath, 240 kilometers, that allows us to operate in a 12-day exact repeat orbit, giving us complete coverage of all the land and ice covered surfaces of the earth every 12 days from ascending and descending perspective. Our resolutions are on the order of 10 meters, let's say. So a 10 meter uh, map of the earth every 12 days, two times. And the mission duration is nominally three years for NASA. That's just the way they plan their missions. But if it's healthy, it will last longer. ISRO is planning to operate it for five years. Uh, and of course, since it's a joint partnership, uh, NASA will extend that uh, to five years a minimum and perhaps beyond that if uh, everything is healthy. We've got great pointing control uh, and uh, orbit control for interferometric purposes. Uh, oopsie, are we still there? There we are. Sorry. You're still here. Yeah. <laughs> it's 
Sorry, I was playing with the windows to clean them up. Uh, and we have a duty cycle, meaning we can operate for much of the time on orbit so we can get complete land and ice coverage. We also have a unique observation perspective. The, the radar looks off to the side for technical reasons, which means that we don't get, we're in an orbit that's slightly tilted relative to the poles. That means that we are preferentially looking at either the North Pole or the South Pole, depending on which way we're pointing. Uh, for NISAR in particular, we are going to look only to the left side of, their, of the orbit vector, which means that we will be mostly looking at Antarctica and the Arctic will be uh, covered by other satellites. So the measurements, I alluded to this when we were uh, showing the animations, we have two fundamental measurements. One is polarimetric radar. So polar, polarization of the, of the signal that we transmit, we can control. We can transmit either uh, with a orientation of the electromagnetic wave uh, horizontally or vertically, or some combination of those. And then we can receive the signal in those orientations as well. The polarization is a, a characteristic um, of the, the, the surface geometry will affect the polarization of the reflected signal. So by using polarimetric radar, we can actually understand the geometric shapes in any given pixel uh, and how those might be changing over time. So for example, the biomass has a, you have a canopy and you have trunks and the ground. The polarization signature of the canopy is very different from the polarization signature of the ground. So by using this polarimetric uh, measurement, we can determine where there is canopy and where there isn't, how dense the canopy is, and therefore track biomass changes. As you can see from the list here, there's also many, many other things that we can use polarimetric diversity for, soil moisture being one of the major things for NISAR. Uh, the other me measurement is called interferometric SAR. We are taking one image at one time, flying back at another time, taking another image, and literally interfering the two signals together in a way that gives us a measure of the difference in the wave crests, as I mentioned, the difference in the phase of the signal, which then is an indicator of the difference in the distance from the satellite to that point on the ground. And since we're flying a sort of exact repeat orbit, we know where the satellite is, we can measure precisely how the ground has changed. So you can see here, uh, uh, two images interfered together around an earthquake give you this beautiful pattern of uh, color. The color is um, a measure of the distance the ground has moved in a relative sense. So if we say that out here in the orange area that I'm pointing to is no motion, it's actually a little motion here, but let's just say it's no motion. Then as you go through the color wheel back to the next uh, orange color, you've moved, the ground is moved by, in this case, something like 11 centimeters, so, so, so many inches. And you can measure this precisely down to millimeter scale. So it's really quite an amazing measurement one can make from space. And you can see the number of applications is quite large. We can study the motion of catastrophic events like earthquakes and volcanoes, landslides, but also slow deformation such as subsidence and uplift like I showed you in those animations, as well as all glaciers and other things like that. Very, very powerful measurement technique. This is a unique radar in that we have two. One is at the longer wavelength and one is at the shorter wavelength. And you can see not we don't have any real measurements like this yet in space. Um, there are some airborne measurements, but the closest thing we have from the spaceborne measurement is from the 1994 experiment called SIR-C, Shuttle Imaging Radar-C, and XR. Shuttle Imaging Radar had two uh, long wavelengths, the L-band and C-band, which is sort of like S-band. So this is almost like what you would see with NISAR. Not quite. And here's a combination, red, green, and blue are colorized for the different wavelengths and different polarization types. And you can see wheat fields have a very different color uh, signature than uh, rubber plantations 
So we use this kind of polarimetric and frequency information to discriminate land classes and uh, measure, you know, precisely dynamic changes in biomass, things like that. So that's sort of an overview of the science. Let me just talk about the system itself now. Um, this, as I said, is an integrated system of systems, and it's really quite a partnership. I have to say, uh, very rewarding partnership, but complex, no, no doubt. Here's the flight system. Again, this is a 12 meter deployable reflector to set the scale, it's a very large system. And you can see all of the radar electronics, L and S band are on this uh, octagonal structure down here. And there's this boom and reflector system provided by NASA. The structure itself was built by NASA and then the electronics for L and S band were populated by both NASA and ISRO. In addition to the radar systems, two systems, there's also sort of duplicate, uh, not duplicate, but uh, uh, um, uh, compatible uh, engineering systems for controlling the radars. We have something on the NASA side called the engineering payload with all of these components. And then of course the spacecraft itself that ISRO is providing has its own computer system and data systems. So all of these systems have to interact together flawlessly in terms of timing and control in order to make our observation plan a real thing. We have a planning cycle. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. That is integrated between spacecraft operations and radar observations. That is quite complex. And then we have actually duplicate uh, downlink systems, one that downlinks to the NASA downlink network and one that downlinks to the ISRO downlink network in order to get this huge volume of data to the ground that we're creating. We have dual processing systems and dual science team. So this requires lots of coordination, I have to say. Um, I'm not gonna say too much about this, except that the mission operations is jointly done with uh, a net NASA network and a uh, ISRO network for downlink. So all the observations have to be planned and then downlinked very precisely using high rate data systems. So very complex operations as well, system of systems. This sweeps our technique, uh, I show this mostly to show you this animation. I'm not sure anybody on this call is too interested in the details, but it's a very complex radar system where we transmit over a large portion, that red, uh, the red flash that you saw there transmits over the whole aperture it illuminates a portion of this reflector, which then illuminates a large area on the ground. And then using digital processing techniques, the echo that comes back to the radar is reflected into a specific spot on this radar feed. And that allows us then to uh, track that at real time, with real time being the speed of light, all these echoes coming back to the radar, synthesize them all up to create um, our final imaging beam. It's very complex and first of a kind. Both the L-band and the S-band systems operate in this fashion. I'll leave it at that. That allows us to create an observation uh, plan using these polarimetric high-resolution images that covers the entire land and ice-covered surfaces that are visible. We don't see the very North Pole, as I mentioned earlier, but we see all of Antarctica. These colors just represent different modes that we're using. So don't really need to know them in detail, uh, but uh, it shows you that we get complete coverage of all the land and ice covered surfaces. And that happens every 12 days. So you can imagine the amount of data we're taking is enormous. There's about 1.6 petabytes of raw data per year. That's hundreds of thousands of DVDs if you need a scale. And that's just the raw data. Once you process it to higher level products, it expands by something like a hundredfold. So it's a lot of data that we're planning to create. Um, this may be too detailed for this audience, but uh, we are producing products at a number of different levels. These are first of a kind products, which um, are, are uh, very, very exciting for the science community. It will make their lives very, very easy. Uh, to be able to use these products at a higher level rather than 
looking at radar images, which are difficult to interpret. In addition, the science team that's uh, been engaged for the last 10 years has been producing uh, producing algorithms that are available to the public that will allow you to create any of these derived products similar to what I showed you in those animations. So these are tools that are publicly available that can be applied to the NISAR data by anybody. In addition to that, there are other programs that are producing actual global products at even higher levels, such as global surface water extent, global disturbance, and global soil moisture. So in addition to the radar data themselves and derived products, there will be global products that come out of NISAR. That's very exciting, first of a kind products, similar to the animations. We're doing all of this on the cloud. I'm not gonna say much more about that. This is certainly the trend of most large data systems now to handle hundreds of petabytes of data. And the idea is that users will try to do their processing and analysis on the cloud rather than downloading these huge volumes of data. NASA has an open source science policy and NISAR, I would say, is well ahead of the curve. We adopted this independent of NASA's direction well before uh, the direction existed. So from day one, we have been uh, pursuing an open data policy. All the data that's placed at the Alaska Satellite Facility is um, free and open, both for the NASA and the ISRO data sets. We, are, we have open source software, the same code that processes the data for the project is available already on GitHub for people to use. Our science algorithm that derive the higher level products are also available on GitLab already. And we have quite a bit of training uh, material available and continue to do that. And there are comp computing resources for NASA subscribers worldwide. You just get an Earth data login. You should be able to access both our data and the tools in order and, and computational skills in order to be able to do this. So uh, we're hoping that these data set will be easy to use and uh, we'll provide the tools to use them. So uh, that sort of summarizes, this just summarizes all the different kinds of applications that we uh, expect to be able to, uh, to do with NISAR, deformation, damage, uh, aquifer health, disturbance, ice sheets, sea ice, biomass and crops. These are sort of the, the large scale, um, large scale uh, targets of our research, but of course, there's many, many other things that can be uh, studied with this as well. We have a large community. We've had a number of workshops, uh, one in 2022, a science workshop, another one in India. We continue to have these workshops into the future. We've also had many, um, many other um, meetings as, as well uh, to, to discuss applications. So what's going to happen? We are planning our launch. It says planned uh, March launch. Actually, we're probably now in a April timeframe launch where our launch is now controlled by the launch of another vehicle before us. Our system is pretty much ready to go or will be in a few weeks, but we have to wait for this other launch to get out of the way first. So now we're looking at April. After launch, there'll be a sort of 90-day period of checkout and commissioning such that we can uh, feel confident that the data are going to be acquired properly. And then we'll begin science operations for three years, but probably much longer than that. It says decommissioning out here, but that's just what we have to plan for. If everything is healthy, we expect that it will be extended by this, the NASA peer, um, senior review process. So our development status is that we've gone through all of this very complex integration and test. We now have a system that looks very much like this and is going to be launched. This says January, but this is now April, 2024. Here's just a few pictures of the hardware. This was back in 2020. This is in 2022. They look very similar, but actually this main octagonal structure has been swapped out from a 
uh, a model to the actual flight system. So this is going through thermal and vacuum testing to make sure everything will work when it goes up in space. We shipped all of that by a cargo plane to India and the whole system has been integrated with the spacecraft in India at this beautiful facility. And here's an example of figure in India of the instrument structure being married to the spacecraft bus. So if you are interested in NISAR uh, as a measurement system, it is time to get ready for it. Um, we're in our final stages of integration. We'll be launching soon. We'll have images hopefully within three months of uh, launch, which is in the summer time frame. And we will be producing these global products to high levels of uh, reduction that will hopefully be easy to use by the global community, supporting a broad uh, set of scientific and application uses. And we are hopefully providing the tools that you need, you would need and your students would need to be able to use these data uh, easily. So with that, I will end and take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Much, much appreciated. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and also pin myself here so I can help out reading some of the some of the questions. Wonderful presentation. I think folks are very, very excited about this mission. Um, one of the biggest questions that I know I had and I saw that other people had was, is this is this data going to be available? Are we going to be able to have, have access to these maps? Um, and it seems that eventually we will once the, the commissioning um, you know, everything works well with the commissioning during the first three months and the data starts being uh, um, collected and analyzed and implemented. Uh, one question that came out of that, though, is how long does it take to analyze the data, um, like around like a specific area, for example, that you might be that you might be mapping? So that's a great question, and it depends to what level uh, we're talking about. So the actual production of those products that I call the level two products, which are our global products, uh, those take literally just a day or two to go from acquisition to be placed into the archive. Uh, all we have to do is wait for the orbit, uh, the orbit estimate to be improved to a level that will allow us to process the data automatically. That takes about a day because um, they need to sort of track the, using GPS on board, they need to track the orbit and, and then do a big least squares estimation with all the GPS satellites. So it's a big uh, inversion problem. But after a day, we have a solution that's good enough to create the product. And then the product generation is quite quick. It's all done in the cloud, so it's scalable. So it does sort of independent of how much data we take, we can just create enough jobs to do it very quickly. So that's the level two products. And those will be, I believe, quite useful from uh, most uh, scientists perspective who are interested in creating their own uh, higher level product using their own algorithms. For other regional scale products, um, you would have to use some of the notebooks that we generate or your own algorithms to create the higher level products. Uh, how long those take really depends on the algorithm. Some of them will take, you know, not very long. If you start with our level two products and apply the simple algorithms that exist, it could be done quickly. Uh, other algorithms related to like surface deformation, those can be quite time consuming and could take a while. But again, I want to emphasize, we're not producing a global set of higher level products like those animations I showed you. Those would have to be generated through other programs or through your own uh, use of your own tools or the tools that we provide. That's very helpful because we do have um, probably most likely some older students um, that have had coding and creating their own algorithms would be able to maybe access that data and create some of the maps for their own questions, along with a lot of the scientists, of course, that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, but we were thinking maybe even for, for, younger, for younger students, is there any hope um, for NASA to maybe integrate this into some of the other visualization systems that already are aligned with submissions? For example, I'm thinking of like worldview or 
um, I think there's another visualization system that's connected to some data that, that is collected by previous NASA missions. And I don't know if that's a hope for the future. Um, obviously that might not be on the radar right now. Um, yeah, it's, cer it's certainly not a project uh, requirement to do that, but I, I have to say, um, I think there's enough people out there who have the capabilities already to generate global maps of this nature, both on the science team and in other areas, that this is not really going to be much of a, a challenge. <laughs> I think you'll see within uh, within a few months, uh, these data processed at very large national, regional, or even global scales and placed onto, uh, for example, Google Earth Engine or, or other kinds of visualization systems like that. Google themselves, are, I suspect, will be downloading all of the level two products, yeah. which are analysis ready and placing them on their servers for um, for use. And I know there's other programs. Um, of course, Earth Data, which is NASA's portal for all of their data, will have all of this stuff registered. And you can select an area, right. and figure out what what is there at all level, at all product levels. Awesome. Yeah, that's what I, I was kind of curious about. But that makes total sense. We're really excited to see where folks take all this data, because uh, there's so much overlap with uh, a lot of what our students and citizen scientists collect on the ground. And we're always encouraging uh, our globe community to take those measurements and compare them or look at what other satellite missions or other data collection systems are are collecting and measuring to really understand the holistic view of their observations. Um, well, and now, I know, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, since you bring that bring up the collection of ground truth, I, I suggest that people check out our website and the CalVal plan that's on the website because uh, any kind of citizen science uh, ground truth that would be you know suitable, for example, soil moisture measurements, if you're making them, or uh, we have these so-called windshield surveys of crop areas uh, to see whether they've been disturbed or not. I'm sure that uh, if they are you know, taken in a way that is acceptable and suitable for our own validation, uh, I'm sure our CalVal team would be interested in that. Awesome. Yes, we do have folks taking lots of soil moisture measurements um, and there already are connections with the SMAP mission, which I know was on your visualization at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, which was exciting to see, um, and already several of those other missions. Um, I know we only have about a couple minutes left with you, Paul. Uh, so I wanted to give anyone the opportunity to ask a question, put it in the chat, or raise your hand. Not sure we'll get any others. Ah, uh, the the oh. on, uh, the excellent. Uh, activities for children. Thanks. The opportunity is very, very impressive. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you so much, uh, Dean. Uh, this, this is slides uh, we receive for email, but I can uh, present them for my children and they use them uh, globally. Are you are you asking if we could if you can present this presentation to your to your students? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I participate. Uh, the if if it is, uh, the globe uh, with children, and uh, we love to use the smartphone, and the uh, uh, no the can. Uh, 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 I can't. Uh, I forgot the the. It uh, can help the NASA using uh, present the three clouds and the uh, impression this this participation uh, with the satellites. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. Well, this presentation, this video, will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to share it with your students. 
um, and uh, definitely keep in touch with the launch. Um, I'm not sure if the launch will be publicized. Actually, Paul, that's a great, uh, that's a question. <laughs> I'm not sure if this launch will be um, available to watch live, uh, maybe yep. through NASA website. Yeah, I don't know about the NASA website, certainly the ISRO uh, website. And okay. You know, we'll have it. And I suspect the NASA will make links to it available. Yes. Amazing. That would be something really great to share with your students, Gene. Um, and so we can get those links. We'll try to get those links up on our YCC webinar uh, channel as well, along with this video um, where it will be featured um, and then along with our YouTube on our YouTube channel. Um, but thank you for being here and wanting to share this with your students this is exactly what we, we love to see um, these connections made across the ent entire scientific community. That includes curious students going out and taking those measurements. Um, but with that, I know Paul, um, we, uh, we schedule this till 950. So I wanna be very cognizant of your time. Really, really appreciate uh, you taking the time out today and sharing this amazing, um, this amazing mission that's going to, you know, bring us a lot of really amazing data from a global perspective. And uh, please feel free to reach out to us. If y'all have any questions here today, please feel free to reach out to me and I will pass that along to Paul or the, or the NISAR team, <laughs> uh, NISAR team. Um, but thanks again, Paul, and uh, good luck with the mission. Hope, hopefully April is, April is set. Great. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, go NISAR, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. All right. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.